2 Timothy chapter number 2. As we uh, get ready to turn the corner in May and get ready to go into June, next uh, week, well, next Sunday will be June 4th, and we'll open up a brand new theme of rearing with eternity in view, talking about helping to reach the next generation and prepare the next generation for, to set their hope in God. And we're excited about that. That's going to be a great time. Of course, in the month of June, we have our annual Friend Day that comes up at the end. We'll talk about that at the conclusion of our service this evening. I'm looking forward to reminding you about that wonderful day. But uh, tonight we're talking a little bit in this month about living with eternity in view. And we're trying to do something every day to live, it, live out with eternity in view. And of course, 2 Timothy is a book that was written by a man who was staring in the face of eternity, the Apostle Paul. This is his last swan song. He is no longer in a rented house in Rome. He is in a Mamertine prison. It's no longer a comfortable setting. He could not receive friends the same way he used to. It wasn't just a a Roman soldier across the room taking care of him and coming in and leaning up his shield and his spear and his sword and his, taking his helmet off and sitting across the room from him. Now he's been moved across from the Colosseum. He could probably hear from where he was lions tearing uh, people apart. And, and he, said, he said, I just recently went to court and God delivered me out of the mouth of a lion. He could probably hear the screams and the agonies and the people making fun and cheering on as the, as the wild beasts would tear people apart who are criminals and things of that nature. And it would be just a few days that he, under the direction of Nero, would have his head taken off. A guillotine would take his head off and he would go into eternity in the probably the early days of his sixth decade of life. But uh, he now writes to Timothy. And he wrote many letters, but God included at least 13 of them in our Bible. By the way, I think it probably all of us would be benefited just to learn to write a little bit more. Write letters to your children, write letters to your spouse, write letters to your mom and dad back home, those of you who are here for the summer from the college. Uh, write, write notes to missionaries, encourage them. And I, a Paul, Paul wrote, and a lot of times I think he probably dictated, he would say, I, I, I signed this with my own hand, but uh, he had probably bad vision. But he communicated that way. And of course, he communicated with the different churches of Philippians and Ephesians and Colossians and Corinthians and Romans, the church at Rome. And, and uh, he wrote Philemon, uh, the book of Philemon, to, to the owner of Onesimus and appealed to him and he wrote Titus, that was his other young protege that was really probably a bull in a china closet, a little bit more, more strong, and, and was on the island of Crete there where everybody was so bellies and challenged. But Timothy was a different. Timothy picked him up and probably saw him when he was 13, 14 years old on his first missionary journey. His dad was a Greek, taught him about the myths and the, the legends and all that, the mythology of there. His, da his mother... Her name was Eunice, she was a Jewish girl who had had the Old Testament information, his grandmother Lois, but they were at the church of Lystra when Apostle Paul went through there on his first missionary journey with Barnabas. It was a Lystra that he was stoned and left for dead outside the city. Very possibly, Timothy, maybe his mother ushered him away, but they may have seen him resurrected by the Lord, and when he laid there and here he had given them the gospel. He had preached to them. He had led them to Christ, no doubt, from Judaism to Jesus. And, um, but when he came back around, not this time with Barnabas, with Silas, he came back and he saw that teenager had grown up. And he had a great testimony. Everybody that spoke about him in all the churches in that region, in Derby and Lystra and that area, they all talked very favorably of Hey, there's a good young man, Timothy. Man, he's doing a good job. He's got a great testimony. By the way, it reminds me, everybody ought to have a good testimony. But especially young people. Let no man despise thy youth. Young people, lit up, sit up straight. Pay attention. Get your Bible out. Sing songs and sing your lungs out when it comes time to the song service. Be a good testimony at that. Don't just stand like you're bored out of your, out of your, your gourd. Stand up and sing out. You're singing not to me. You're singing to the Lord. 
You ought, to have a, you ought to have a fervency about you. You ought to have a heart for the Lord. And this young man did. And boy, his, it, was, it, was, it was not just Paul who came through and said, I think I like this guy. Everybody was saying, that Timothy, man, that guy's a good, sharp young man. He loves the Lord. He's overcoming the fact that his father is a Greek and not probably a Christian. But he's got a heart for the Lord. He was probably timid, probably was not the most aggressive of the two. I personally believe, some folks would disagree, that I think Titus was a strong They're both of them were Greek. They both had Greek dads. But Titus probably a little stronger. Paul or Timothy probably a little bit more mild and passive and probably just a servant. He had no idea. He didn't have an interest in leading. He wanted just to be be a help. (laughs) And he he didn't know that he was going to be in charge of, of, of the church at Ephesus for a while and stay there and watch dog over the doctrines. But many years have gone by now. And he has been at the, at the direction of Paul. Paul tells him, go here. He went there. Told him to stay there. He stayed there. But now Paul's in jail. And he writes to him a letter. And he says, look, uh, I'm looking to the face of eternity. He said, uh, the time of my departure is at hand. I'm getting ready to check out. I know it's time. I've already been to court once. And God delivered me. See, all the other guys have gone off to other places. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And he said, uh, he said, I, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. He said, but I'd really like to see you before I die. I want you to do your diligence to get here and get here before winter. Stop by and pick up the coat I left. It's cold in here and the temperatures are falling. He said, I don't have anything to read. I don't have a piece. Of, I don't have all that. So bring the parchments. Go find a Bible. Bring the Bible to me. Bring some other reading books. Bring the books. And it's interesting. Here he was getting ready to die, and he still had an appetite to learn. So I admire Brother Ray taking the Bible Institute as he gets ready to retire, but he's he's had an appetite to learn. Didn't just say, you know what, I've been there, done that, bought the T-shirt, and I'm good. Put a fork in me, it's over. He's continuing to go. And God had a call for his life, and I think that's great. But he was learning. But as Paul looks at Timothy in this passage, there's four chapters. And he first challenges Timothy personally. He references his mother and his grandmother who invested in him as a child. He would tell him in chapter 3 that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures that they will make you wise into salvation. He said, when you're a kid, your grandmother and your mom left you a, a legacy of the Scriptures so that you would know how to get saved. But he would challenge him. He said, remember your ordination. Remember when you were called to preach. You remember the laying on of my hands. He says, he says, neglect not the gift that you got there. He says, he says, God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. So don't be afraid, Timothy. Do what God called you to do and get out there and let the Lord use you and take the courage not for who you are, but who's with you. And make a difference where you are. On that bus route, you ought to make a difference. That Sunday school class, if you've got five kids, try to grow that enrollment to eight. In that Sunday school class, wherever you may, whatever it is, keep growing the enrollment. If you just try to, to, to babysit eight or ten or five or six kids, by the time you finish the year, they're gonna, they're, someone's going to move away or something's going to happen. You're going to be looking at three. Continue to grow the enrollment. Make a difference where you are. And he challenges them on that. In chapter 3, you'll give him a perilous day challenge. He'll say, look, this know also in the last time, perilous times shall come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, heady, high-minded. You know the list, 18 different symptoms of a perilous day. And he'll say they start with selfish sins, and they go to sexual sins. Uh, Men, silly women, laden with sins, and go into an immoral state, and then ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. All it is is a worship of education. They want to learn this and learn this and learn this, but they don't, they've lost the truth. He said, but they will be stopped. In the meantime, the world, what they need from you, Timothy, and he tells us this in chapter 3, he said, they need somebody that has a good testimony. He said, you fully know my testimony, my labor of love, my work, my persecutions I've endured. He said, he said, you've been studying me. And you know how he knew Paul's testimony? He got to see it. You know how people know your testimony? They'll see it. 
If any man loves God, same is known to them. You don't have to go around and tell people, I love God. No, they'll know. Teenager, we can tell if you love God. Mama, we can tell if you love God. Sir, we can tell if you love God. It, it's not something you have to go around and tell people. It's going to be obvious. He said, you need to give a good testimony. You need to be willing to go through difficult times because the Bible says in latter days, men will wax worse and worse, deceiving each other and being deceived themselves. And then he says, you've got to continue in the things that you've heard, been assured of, knowing of whom you learned them. I just want to tell you, don't get bored with the basics. I was talking to a young missionary yesterday, and I was spending time with Brother Stephen Kim, and he said, Pastor, I'm watching my, my, my colleagues that I went to school with just go this way and this way. and It's usually standards of music, and then it's dress, and then it's Bible, Bible versions, and then it's just like everything goes. I said, what in the world? What is advice? I just said, Brother Steve, don't get bored with the basics. Don't be looking for new ideas. Stay, stay with faithful soul winning, holy living, discipleship. Keep reaching one person after one person. God is honored with that. Here is my father glorified. He's not glorified in skinny jeans and, and stupidity. God, the world has nothing God wants to borrow to get his work done. He didn't borrow anything from the devil. No methods, no things. He didn't need that. He needs someone with the power of God in their life and a good testimony and someone who's willing to take it on the chin if you need to. And someone who will continue in the things which you've seen and been assured of, knowing of whom you've seen them and learned them from. And then he says, you have to give devotion to the word of God. And he closes in chapter, chapter three about, about the word of God. So we get the verse, all scriptures give my inspiration of God and it's profitable. But God gave us the Bible for four basic reasons in that passage. Number one, so that we, um, we, we, first of all, we'd be saved. That from a child you've known the Holy Scripture, able to make you wise to salvation. People who get saved, so much show them the Bible. Number two, so you could be successful. So it could be profitable to you. God doesn't, he didn't raise you as a child of God and save you so you could be a flop. But what you and I do with the Bible determines what God does with us. People who get in the word of God, success gets in them. I don't care if it's in business, academics, marriage, child rearing. You get in the word of God and find out some answers and God's, God's success is going to get in you. And your profiting will appear to everyone. And then he tells them in chapter 3, he said, the third reason God gave you the Bible is so that you would mature and be seasoned. That the man of God may be perfect, complete. We're plagued with immaturity. Plagued. With, with short-sighted people who just don't get it. They get mad so easily if something's not done their way. They can't take a reproof. A reproof tells them something's wrong and it points out a failure and it asks them for a change and they just can't take it. And so they go some other place oftentimes so they can come in as they were and left as they came. So someone can pat them on the head and tell them, we did church today, we did church, how do you do it? We do church. They didn't know what in the world happened in that service because nothing changes. But if you, don't, if you don't get your proverbial backside kicked every now and then in a church service or a Sunday school class, you're not going to the right church. <laughs> if you're not getting your face ripped off occasionally, there's something wrong. I'm not here to do that continually, but I don't, I don't need to go to church where someone just makes strokes me and make me feel good about myself. If you want to do that, go to Joel Olstein's. Fly there every weekend if you want. And join all the people and watch the revolving globe, you know, just, just do it. But that's what you want. That's not what, that's not what he, you know, the Bible tells us in chapter 4. Look at chapter 4 real quickly. Look what Paul says in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. I charge, you think charge, is that a soft word? No, it's a strong word. He says, I charge thee. I'm getting in your face, Timothy, before God. You've got a responsibility for the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are they in this passage of Scripture? Who shall do what? Judge. They'll evaluate the quick, that's people that are alive, and people that are lost, dead, in their trespasses and sin. At his appearing in his kingdom, he said when he comes, he's going to evaluate people that are saved and people that are lost. Saved, the judgment seat of Christ, lost at the great fight throne judgment. Then verse number, verse number two, read it out loud with me. Preach the word, be instant, out of season, 
He said, I want you to preach the word. I want you to reprove sometimes. Is that a positive or negative thought in your head? How about rebuke? A little negative. Exhort is more positive with all long suffering. Be, be patient with people while they make adjustments. You don't change people. You, 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 you love people. God does the changing. You, you, a, a lady who will try to work her hard to change her husband will be frustrated the rest of her marriage. Don't try to change your husband. Husband, don't try to change your wife. Hey, Pastor, can you stand with her and just tell her? You're kidding. I don't want to join your frolity. Your, 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 it's not going to work. I want you to get with my husband so you can teach him this right here. You know what you need to do, Mrs.? You need to be the best godly wife you can be and trust God and keep working with him. Exercise some long-suffering. You change you and God will change them. You do the loving, you do the reverencing, and God does his work. I think yeah, precious girls in this room could stand and say, I, I, I agree with that. I tried many years, and it didn't work. I started just doing what God wanted me to do, and it's amazing. He began to change. She began to change. God began to put something together. I sat with a sweet couple recently. I thought they were going to divorce several years ago. I thought it was just all over. And now there's a sweetness, there's a joy, there's a testimony. And it wasn't because either one of them tried to change each other. They just began to walk with God and began to do their stuff, and God began to do his stuff. He tells me, he said, be, be, be long-suffering with people, with doctrine, with truth. Now he's, he's going to say, by the time I depart, I'm getting ready to leave this world. And so he looks, into the, he looks into eternity, and he gives them good advice. I want us to go to chapter 2, because that's where we're going to be just for a few moments. And I need to hasten. But in chapter 2, chapter 1 was a personal challenge. Chapter 3 is a perilous state challenge. Chapter 4 is that final parting challenge. Chapter 2 is very practical. He's going to begin to name different things. Even in, uh, in Brother Ray's message tonight, the verse that got a hold of his heart is in chapter 2. Study to show thyself unto a workman. Need not to be ashamed, right by the, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you'll see, he's going to say, I want you to be like this. I want you to consider these, these kind of people, and I want you to pattern your ministry, Timothy, after them. Look at verse number one, would you please? Chapter two, therefore, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He said, you're my son. I want you to firm up and be strong. By the way, young men, we need strong young men. And I'm not just talking about physical strong. I think you ought to be physically strong, but I think you've got to be strong enough to pay attention in church. Strong enough to sing the songs. I love seeing these young people sing. I love to have a men sing. It's great. But in, I'm talking about in the audience. I'm talking strong enough to stand up to people that you know are falling out. Strong enough to say, you know, look, hey, amen, not, we're not talking that way. Either you fix it or I'll fix it with you. Someone's just strong. So I want you to be strong. And not in your own ability, but in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, when you see the word grace, that's how we got saved. We got saved by grace. For by grace are ye saved through faith. That means God does his work. I'm putting my faith in God's work. You know, after God saves me, the Bible tells us in Titus chapter 2, the grace of God which appeared to all men that brings to us salvation, that same grace sets up a classroom in our heart teaching us to deny ungodliness and live soberly and righteously in this present world. So God's grace doesn't just save me, it sets up a classroom to instruct me how to live holy and righteously and purposely in this world. One of the words, I cannot stand it, drives me, whatever, whatever, sarah, sarah. It is what it is. No, we ought to think about that. I think those are opposite of purpose. God challenges with the word sober. It means to with purpose. And you know, he's telling him, he said, look, I, I, I think you need to be strong in the grace is in Christ Jesus. The, the Christ that saved you, now live out his grace and let him help you in this, in this role. And it's not going to be for the faint of hearts. Anybody who serves Jesus Christ is going to have to do that against the grain. It's not made for the weak of heart. You're going to have to serve God. You're going to get, get strong. You're going to have to be free from the love of money. You're going to have to be a, have a heart that's hot for souls. You're going to have to be a man of prayer, a woman of prayer. You're going to have to be a student of God's word. These are some things that have to be a humble man, a surrendered man. 
You can't just do it. You can't just march to the beat of your own drum and say, God, catch up with me. I'm going someplace. No, no. You want to let him to lead you. So I want you to be strong in the grace that, that's in Christ Jesus. Verse number two, he says, here's his, his strength. Number two, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. He said, I want you to be a, a teacher. I want you to reproduce yourself. I want you to take the things you've learned and give it to other people. This is one of the reasons that, that for, for uh, nine years that the Lord has let us serve God together, I've been challenged you to disciple someone. And some of you do, and some of you have no interest in it. I don't understand it. You got the same 168 hours I got in my week, and you have the same, I, I have the same as you. Can we not find an hour where we can love someone and spend time with them? It's not about the books. Discipleship is not about a book. It's not about a program. It's not about foundations of our faith or help from a big brother. It's not about one-on-one. -on -one. It's about one Christian sharing the life of Christ with another Christian. Taking the things that you've learned and passing them on to somebody else. Life-on-life -life discipleship is so needed. And he says, Paul, Timothy, be strong in the grace that God's, God's given you in the Jesus Christ. Number two, be a teacher. Take the things you've learned and pass it on. How many of you have ever heard a funny joke? And you thought to myself, when I get home, I'm going to tell my friends, my wife, my kids, I can't, they're going to laugh. It's, it's hilarious. You get home and you can't remember what made you laugh. If your life depended on it, you can't remember it. You have forgotten that funny joke. Do you know why you forgot the joke? You know how you can remember a joke? Tell a joke. You tell it about three or four times, you'll remember when you get home. You know how you learn the Bible? Teach the Bible. I learned more Bible between the age of 32 and 33 years old when I became a pastor of a church than I did my whole other 32 years altogether. I heard so many life-changing messages, I didn't know where I was and who I was prior to that. When I started teaching the Bible, I had to learn some Bible. I had to learn it. And you, learned, you know how you learn the doctrines? Some of you, you couldn't tell me two verses on eternal security if your life depended on it. I just, I just said, stand up over here in this section right here. Tell me, young man, tell me, young lady, tell me, senior adult, you've learned some many messages. Just tell me two verses on eternal security, how I know I can never lose my salvation. Some of you would be looking down at the floor and studying, the, studying your shoelaces. Don't ask me. I don't know. You know why you don't know? You don't teach eternal security. Some of you, you know you're supposed to get baptized after you're saved. You don't know where in the world to find that in the Bible. And you've, you've listened to thousands of messages. You know why you don't know it? You don't teach it. You start, you start discussing with people. You'll start making notes in your Bible. You'll write it down. If I ask you, I want you to give me three verses on the deity of Christ. Why is Jesus God? Some of you, you've been, you've been saved for decades, and you couldn't give me two verses on the deity of Christ. You're not bad people. You're just like I was. And I started discipling people. The disciple of Bernard, then Eddie and then Barry, and then Eric. I started discipling these people. You know, as I started teaching it, that became a part of me. Like, man, that is good. I didn't learn that in Bible doctrines in college. If I learned it, it went in one ear and out the other. But now that I'm teaching it, it becomes a part of me. Some of you need to do that. And here Apostle Paul says, look, as I look in the face of eternity, and I only have one chance, if you don't get to me soon, I want you to make sure that you are strong in the grace of Christ. Number two, that you take the things you've learned. Don't just be a dead sea. Just take it in, take it in, take it in. I hope pastor's got a good one tonight. I'm so sleepy. I want to get fed. You don't need to. You, I'm glad you come. And I hope we can stimulate something occasionally and teach something from the scriptures that will help us. We work hours every week trying to make sure that we're prepared when we come up. And sometimes I feel like I'm not prepared. But nonetheless, the truth of the matter is, you can learn by teaching. Take the things you've learned. If you're a bus captain, teach others to be a bus captain. If you know how to drive a bus, get somebody else to, to, to get their CDL. You sing in the choir, recruit somebody else to sing in the choir with you. You know how to play an instrument? You know someone else plays an instrument, they're just not here? Hey, maybe you could help them. You work in the nursery, help someone else work in the nursery. You work in the Pathfinders, let's encourage someone else to work in the Pathfinders. 
Whatever it is that God taught you to do, and especially biblically, teach to somebody else. Let's do one more thing that he says. Number one, he says, I want you to be a son, a good, strong person in the grace of Christ. Number two, I want you to take the things you've learned and pass them on to other people. Number three, look at verse number three, if you would, please. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So you're a teacher, then you're a soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse number four is the verse that goes with that. Let's read out loud together. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. He said, uh, I want you to be a strong like a soldier. You know, soldiers, several things that soldiers are. They have to be simplistic. Okay? They need to be strong. And really, they need to care about others. They don't fight their own battles. They don't go to Afghanistan for them. They have to understand that life has to be simple for them. Then they don't take their entertainment centers to the, to, 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 the, to the war zone. They don't, they, don't, they don't take a whole bunch, of, they don't take all their little airplane models they put together in the fifth grade with them. No, they just take what they need to get in there, get the job done, and get out. They're simplistic, they're strong, and then uh, they have to be submissive. I think that's another thing that comes to my mind. And, you know, every, every once in a while I find someone who just brags about how rebellious they are. Do you know what the Bible says about rebellion? I think you might look it up and see that it's not really something to brag about. You know, to be submissive, to be simple, to be selfless, and to be strong. He said, because anyone who wars, that goes to war, doesn't get entangled with the affairs of this life. But he's focused on trying to please the one that chose him to be in the army. He said, Timothy, you got to figure this out. As I look through the lenses and look in the face of eternity, he says, I just want to challenge you. Now, Paul wasn't getting out of jail. He wasn't giving this to him. His, his, he, he's getting ready to sign off on his autobiography unedited. He's writing to a young man that's free as a bird. He's not in jail. He's committed to serve the Lord, and he tells him, Timothy, be strong. Don't, don't get weakened, but get strong in the grace of God. By the way, he giveth grace to the humble. Be humble enough to accept God's help to help you. Be a teacher. Keep reproducing yourself. And then he says, be a soldier. A soldier must be strong. He must be simplistic. Don't get entangled with stuff. Some of you, God's already tapped you on the proverbial shoulder and told you, I want you to serve me. And you're fighting and you're getting more possessions, more stuff, and, and it's, you're getting crippled. You're doing less now than you should be doing more now. I'm not talking about going somewhere else. Some of you can do it right here at First Baptist Church. But you could be more free. You could, be, you, could be, you could give more time to ministry, more time to win the lost, more time to disciple people, and you've let all your stuff, just, your possessions possess you. So don't, don't be simple. Be submissive. And you're going to have to be selfless. This battle is not about you, it's not about me, it's about him. Let's pray together, can we?